This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas 75771, or calling 903 963 8626. You are welcome to make additional cassettes of this message for free distribution to friends. However, for all other forms of reproduction or electronic transmission, existing copyright laws apply. I want to speak to you this morning on a crisis of faith. We're, we're facing in the Church of Jesus Christ a crisis of faith. We'll share this with you from uh, 1 Peter. If you want to turn to 1 Peter, <clears throat> the first chapter, verses 5 through 7. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we honor your word in this church. We, we, we just long and yearn for the word that comes from your heart. And Lord, we thank you this morning that we anticipate your voice. We anticipate you speaking through human flesh. Lord, we pray that there be a sanctifying, not only in prior studies of this word, but sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in process now of preaching. God, Come upon me and let me speak your mind, not my own heart. Give me grace. Give me your spiritual authority that comes only from your word, anointed by your spirit. Lord, speak to everyone in this house, especially those who are going through the trial of their life. Those, O oh Lord, who, who are being tested. Those who are going through it this morning, sitting here, maybe clapping their hands and being a part of what God is doing here in marvelous worship, but still carrying such a burden, and there's such a uh, such a this horrible sense that there's danger ahead for them in their life, and maybe a, a frightening of the enemy trying to come upon them. Lord, break that this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm saying again, the church is in a crisis of faith. <clears throat> Men of God are being tested as never before, and many are falling away. Jesus was not just making small talk when he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In light of what he said, he's anticipating a, a trial of faith. He's anticipating that many will lose their faith. In fact, he says, will I find any faith left on the earth when I return? He anticipated what we're seeing happen in the church of Jesus Christ today. Paul, 1 Timothy 4.1 said, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul warned Timothy to hold fast the faith because he was alarmed at what he called so many putting away faith and ending up in shipwreck. He said they're putting aside, they're casting aside their faith, and tragically they're ending in shipwreck. He saw that happening in his time, and looking in the future, he warned us to this very day. Paul warned the Christians that this is even after uh, the upper room and the caring of the widows, and he said many of these widows are casting away their first faith. And he said already they've turned aside to Satan. He's, here, here is the church ministering to these widows, and they're turning away, casting away, right in the midst of this Holy Ghost outpouring and the God doing such a great work. They, they have their test of faith, and they fail, and they're casting away their faith. And he said, how quickly when you do that, you turn to the works of Satan. Peter warned that a crisis of faith would come upon the church in the last days. He said, we are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation to reveal, be revealed in the last times. He said, there's going to be a great faith being revealed to the body of Christ, having to do with their salvation, having to do with this walk, 
He said that in the last days there's going to be a great revelation. And I'm saying to you that great revelations are going to come through incredible tests of faith in crises that we are brought to, brought to the brink of crises to bring out of us this faith that is more precious than gold, that in the last days when all things are spinning out of control, God has a witness that he's in control and his testimony is through people who have been tried and tested beyond measure. Now, he said, you've been distressed by various trials, 1 Peter 1, 6. You are being tested as by fire. Now for a season, if need be. If need be. Now, God knows. God knows when we, when he allows a crisis to come into heart and the purpose of it all. He said, if need be for a season, God brings you into a place of great trial troubles on every side, if need be for a season. And God always has a divine purpose. God gets no pleasure out of this other than to see what it brings forth of his, his godly nature and this faith that's more precious than gold in, in his sight in the last days. If need be. <clears throat> Many great men and women in this, in, in this, in these scriptures came to a crisis of faith and they endured. They came through with confidence and trust. In the most dangerous, critical, unbelievable times, they were brought to the brink of disaster. And they held on and they trusted God. And you find their testimony in Abraham and, and Noah. You, you see it in Joseph and Jacob and Enoch all through the Bible. Every one of these men came to the brink. Every one of these men were tested. Every one of these came to a crisis of faith, and they endured. And they have been our testimony down the centuries. But you find many others in the Scripture who failed the test. I'm going to talk to you about three of these men. I'm going to talk about Saul, Samson, and Solomon. All men called and anointed of God who failed the test. The crisis of faith. And I want to show you that God himself brought them to the crisis. God himself waiting to produce, wanting to see produced in every one of these men something that he could, he could use as an example to their generation. And enduring. He was ready to make enduring testimonies of these men, but they failed. When men of God lose their faith... You'll find as I go through this that they end in ruin and shame. Now, Paul said that the Old Testament is an example meant for our learning. In other words, if you want to learn my ways, you get it from the Old Testament. I've been accused in <coughs> preaching too, for, being, uh, for preaching too much in the Old Testament. I get letters from our mailing list saying, are, are you just an Old Testament preacher? Well, if you've been here, you know better than that. But my grandfather taught me that Christian character comes from the Old Testament. And, and you, you learn the lessons of character, and you learn these, and then it's brought to life by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Those examples are lived out in the New, giving us hope. I'm going to show you these three men that were brought into crisis and why and how they failed as a warning to us. We we'll speak first of all of Saul, king of Israel, who failed in his crisis of faith. Now, here's a chosen man. He's anointed by God's Spirit. He's given a new heart, the Scripture says. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And the Bible even said this man prophesied. Truly a call of God in this man's life. Truly a man who starts right from the very beginning. A man who understood the Word of God. There was no confusion about the Word of God being revealed to this man. The Scripture says, Samuel communed with Saul. And he's saying, stand still a while that I may show you the Word of the Lord. He was clearly shown the Word of the Lord. It was on that housetop that he was told, every time you call, every time there's warfare in Israel, you go to, you go to Gilgal. Uh, 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 give me, uh, go to Gilgal and you wait seven days 
Wherever I'm at, the furthest point would be seven days. I'll never be more than seven days away. But you don't go to war. And these were instructions, the Word of God given clearly to this man. You don't go to war until I come and we will build an altar and we will sacrifice and we will worship the Lord before we go to battle. No matter what the battle is, how many or how few, that is where you assemble your troops. And word will be brought to me, and this was the clear, the word of the Lord was brought to him. God then turned him into another man, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. You see, God never calls a person to his work or ministry in the church of any uh, any ministry of the church whatsoever. He never calls you without equipping you. This man was called and he was equipped by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God came upon him. This is his first year and his first victory among, over the Ammonites. The Spirit of God came on him and Israel slew them until there were no two men left together. A total, complete victory. And this man is on the right track. This man has the blessing and favor of God. And God fully intended to give him an everlasting kingdom. In fact, that is what was Samuel told him later. He said, you have nullified when he said, you've nullified God's plan for an everlasting kingdom for you and your family and your seed. And two years into his reign, the scripture says the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. A great army came up. Now, he had been given God's word. He calls the troops, <clears throat> and they're gathered in Gilgal. And in this time, his troops are deserting on all sides. Some are hiding in caves and in pits. They are leaving in droves, and there's only a handful left, and they were trembling. And some of them were leaving and deserting to other countries for a safe haven. And he looks at this deteriorating scene. And every hour, it becomes more dangerous, more and more leaving. And this man is saying to himself, God surely doesn't expect me to stand here and just wait. This is out of control. There's no hope. And he waits halfway through the seventh day, probably till twilight. He doesn't see him anywhere. He doesn't see Samuel. He does not appear. And this is the seventh day. And he turns to his servants. He said, bring me a heifer. Bring me a calf. And he turns to Abiah and he says to the priest stand beside him, offer it now. We're going to offer. This is too dangerous. And I see them slay the lamb, and I see them lay it on the wood, and I see the man with the torch ready. And in historical perspective now, from where I stand, I want to scream, Saul, don't do it. Hold on. This is a test. No matter how dangerous it is, no matter what it looks like, Samuel's probably right over the hill. The heart, I've said over and over, the hardest part of faith is the last half hour. Just before the victory, most people give up. And I want to scream at him, don't do it. You've waited this time. Wait a few more hours. He won't wait. Saul refuses to wait. They ignite the fire and the lamb is sacrificed. And no longer does he ignite that fire and the sacrifice is burning. And over the hill comes Samuel. And Samuel says, what have you done? And implied in that is, don't you know the danger of what you have done? Don't you understand that God has no patience for unbelief? You understand that this is foolishness. You have acted foolishly. You've nullified God's plan for the rest of your life. He said, that's the Old Testament God. Now, we'll, we'll show it to you further than that. New Testament as well. God has no patience, no pity when he has made divine promises so clear. 
And he says, I will never delay. I will always be on time. Not your time, but on my time. And I will not fail you. We have a Bible full of those promises. This man was given the word of God. Samuel said, I will be there. We will sacrifice. There was no sign of Samuel when he did it. Samuel said, you've acted foolishly. You've nullified the plan of God for your life. Now, folks, we're talking about trusting God in real danger, not just perceived danger, but in real danger. Folks, this was dangerous. The enemy was coming. They're mounting their attack. They're ready to move. You say, well, I can't believe that God... Almighty God would allow things in my life <clears throat> to deteriorate so much that, 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 that I come to a point of danger, that I, I, I come to the point where I lose all hope. And it, it's it, the only thing that could happen that could rescue would be an absolute supernatural miracle. As if God wasn't a supernatural miracle worker. But you see, that's exactly what Jesus did. When he is told by a messenger from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is sick near death. And he sends back a message. And he says, this is not unto death. And the Bible said when he heard he was sick, he abode two days still at the same place where he was. He's five miles away. He hears that his friend Lazarus is dying. So tell him this, this is not unto death, but this is, this is going to end in the, in glory to God. Out of this crisis is going to come a miracle. Out of this is going to come glory to the Father. And Jesus stands still. Jesus allows the situation to worsen. In fact, he allows the situation to go beyond the point of danger to hopelessness. To death. Because he's looking. Hopefully at his friends. Those who know his heart. Those who have fellowshiped and communed with him and know his word. And know that he's resurrection and life. That they would be able to say no matter what happens. God will get glory. God will rescue me. God out of this out of this hopelessness, God has a plan. I don't understand it. To me, it's hopeless. To me, there's death all around. To me, I just have to resign right now. God, it's all in your hands. I tell you, my brother, sister, your crisis is not hopeless. God is not going to be late. It may worsen. It may get so bad that you, you will be convinced that it's all over. And you will say, Lord, if you'd only been here. If you'd only been on time. See, his friends failed the test. If you had only been here. And here he stands. The resurrection and the life. No matter what you're going through, I'm telling you, there he stands. Side by side with you, saying, in the time of the trouble, I am near. I am near you. I am very present in the help in the time of trouble. Very present. I, he says, I'm at your right hand. I have all the power and the glory that is needed to answer every problem with him. Nothing is impossible. And Saul fails this test because he will not trust God in his crisis. He degenerates into greater darkness, greater unbelief, and finally ends up consulting with the witch and dies in unbelief. What a life, what a horrible thing that happens to Christians who jettison their faith, who lose their faith and say, God failed me. They lose somebody in the family. Death strikes and they, uh, uh, I have a letter from a dear pastor friend of mine in Europe. His wife, a few weeks ago, was killed in a car crash, and the two children survived. He, he was not driving. His wife was driving. He was not in the car. And it's been three weeks now. And he, 
he's, he's a great man of God, a bishop. And he said, David, I thank you for your letter of comfort. But he said, I, I, I just can't be consoled. And I pulled out a bunch of scriptures and I'm emailing it to him because the word is the only strength and the hope. But you see, God has not abandoned that man. He feels abandoned. He, he feels guilt. He feels so many things. You know, he's a patient God. He, he, he'll let you wade through all of that. But you've, there comes a place that you have to come out. You have to come out and say, my God is faithful. I will trust him no matter what. If you have to look death in the eye, God will get glory. God has a reason beyond anything that he has. He doesn't even need to explain it to us. No, it's beyond. I stood in front of Tiffy's casket. And it was a crisis of faith. I either stand there and say, oh, God, you would never do this without a plan. Oh, no, 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 no. You would not do this. You, you don't purposely hurt your children. You don't abandon. There's something that I don't know. But one thing I do know, that you're faithful. And to see and feel the strength of the Holy Spirit. And folks, I want you to know our family passed that test. This man failed the test. Let's talk about Samson. Here's a man, the Bible said, moved upon by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He's a Nazarite. He's taken the Nazarite vow. He's separated unto the Lord. He's called to be the deliverer of Israel. He's one of the judges called to be a deliverer. And he, he once again, this man starts out right. In fact, he's listed in Hebrews 11.32. as one of those who, through faith, stopped the mouth of lions, turned to flight armies. Now, this suggests to me that the Spirit of the Lord came on him mightily as a result of his faith. He said, through faith he did these things. Through faith the Spirit of God came upon him. It was not just his strength. The Bible said that there was, uh, <clears throat> when he, the lion came against him, there was nothing in his hand, proving that the old covenant gives nothing in your hand in the flesh. But... He came out with nothing in his hand, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And I, I know it's because faith arose in this man's heart that God is with me, and he rips the lion apart. And the devil is that roaring lion, and he, the Holy Ghost comes upon us. And by faith, the Scripture said, through faith in the work of the Holy Spirit, we have victory over sin. Through the Spirit, the deeds of the flesh are overcome. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through faith. And he judged Israel 20 years. For 20 years, he's moving and ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. For 20 years, he has a series of small victories. You don't find any major victory. <clears throat> you don't find him defeating the Philistines. All through his ministry, all through his judgeship, he, he is very, it's very limited in his success. And after 20 years, the scripture says, I, don't want, I want you to listen very, very closely, please. He judged Israel for 20 years. Then, after that, that means after the 20 years of ministry, then went Samson to Gaza and saw their harlot and went into her. Four verses later, 16.4, we read, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in Sorek whose name was Delilah, another prostitute. Now, why would a man of God so anointed under Nazarite vow, so touched with Holy Spirit coming mightily upon him, how does he come to this place where he now consorts with prostitutes? But how is it that this man, who had been called and anointed of God after 20 years of service, is now giving himself to raging lust? How is it you find him running down to the Philistines 
into their, into their slums, into their dark alleys where only prostitutes could possibly hang out. What's wrong with this man? I suggest to you he lost his crisis of faith. He failed in his crisis of faith. Think about Samson for, for the past 20 years. Think of a man who's looking back and saying, I have not fulfilled my purpose. I was called to deliver Israel and I don't see victory. I don't see God really doing that much with me. Oh, you find him. Yes, he, he slays a lion. You find him putting fields on fire. You, you find, you, you find him killing 1,000 men. That was his biggest victory, 1,000 men. But in that 20 years, you've, you hear very little of victory. Very little of going against the enemy. And Samson looking about, back, and he's thinking of Jephthah, one of the former judges. And the Bible says the whole army stood with him to go against the enemy. He had a whole army of men standing with him. And he thinks of Abner, the, the, the judge just before him, who had... Uh, Forty sons and thirty nephews, all who rode fine horses and colts. He had his own army. He had those who stood with him. Samuel looks at his life and he said, nobody stands with me. In fact, three thousand of his own friends, Judaites, come to him with a rock and bind him with cords and turn him over to the Philistines. This man is lonely. This man says, I'm not appreciated. God calls me. I stand and give my life for these people. Nobody stands with me. Folks, I see that as the cause of so much discouragement with preachers where I'm, I'm going. You, you find it. Bettina, who goes ahead and sits at the meetings, brings back reports saying that the, there's such weariness and pastors are saying, I am not appreciated. I have so few people to help me. And, 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 there's nobody to stand with me because their churches are small. And, and at this point, and I have heard pastors by the hundreds. And I, I've seen them and I hear, I don't listen to hundreds of testimonies, but I get them here and there out of the hundreds. And I hear this cry that must have been in Samson's heart. God, I don't see fruit. I see others being used. When I look back through history and those who preceded me, but here I am at this stage of life and I've had 20 years of ministry. I've had 20 years of working for you in your house. And I don't see fruits. I don't see being appreciated by the people and I don't have anybody standing with me and I'm lonely. I wanted a wife, and that fell through. He said, I, I don't see it in, in, in this crisis of faith. He said, I don't need to take this anymore. I don't need to live like this. I've battled so hard for the Lord, and there's some of you sitting here now thinking about the struggle you're in, and you're saying, I don't need this. And you see, Samson just gives up. Samson quits on God. You never find from that time on, from the trip down to Gaza, you never find a word of ministry. You, you will find uh, uh, some showmanship. You will find him tearing the bars off a gate and taking a mountain ten miles away, which had no spiritual meaning whatsoever. And it doesn't say anymore if the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Because you see, now he's walking in the flesh. And there are some of you here right now saying, I don't have to take what I'm taking. And why should I live so a stringent life? Why should I live in prayer and seeking God when I don't see anything happening? I don't have to live so straight-laced. I don't have to be going to church and reading my Bible. I don't have to do all this stuff anymore. I need to relax. I need some fun in my life. Oh, this is Samson on his way down to Zurich to a deceived Philistine prostitute. 
full of deception, the devil incarnate in her. And I say, Samson, you're the picture. And I say it loving, you're the picture of what happens when Christians become discouraged and have some root of bitterness in their heart toward God. Why did you allow all this to happen? Why? Where, where, where are the signs of the anointing? Where are the signs of victory? Why is the enemy still prevailing in my life? Well, for the people, you talk about a time to, of testing. That is the time of testing, especially when you have a habit or besetting sin that lingers year after year. And here's 20 years of an undefeated enemy. Well, that's the time when the enemy comes and says, quit. That's the time to take your hurts to the Lord. Get running, run in quickly to the secret closet and fall on your face before the Lord and say, oh, God, help my unbelief. God, don't let me spin out into that dark place. Don't let me go out now angry at you. Stay before the Lord until he comforts your heart. The Lord understands your pain. If you bring that pain to him, Samson did not bring his pain to the Lord. He did not reach out and cry out to God in his hour of need. He reached out to prostitutes. Am I speaking to someone here in that kind of crisis? Oh, Think of the ruin and the shame of this man. He stands after they capture him, take out his eyes. That represents the loss of all discernment. He wants one last victory. He's asked to be put between two columns and his hair has grown again and the strength of the Lord is coming upon him, the physical strength. And he said, oh, God, give me one last victory. And he didn't say for your glory. He said that I may avenge myself on my enemies. A heart full of revenge and anger and bitterness. That's the life of the unbeliever. That's the life of those who won't hold steady. Say, oh, God, live or die, I'm going to trust you through my struggle. I'm going to trust you to give me victory in my life. And I'm going to believe in the power of the Holy Ghost to do what he's promised to do. I'm not hurrying on Solomon. He lost his faith. He was a man who had it all. A godly heritage, a personal encounter with God, gift of wisdom beyond all men on the face of the earth. A clear supernatural calling, an understanding of nature, an understanding of God's heart. God loved him and he loved God. The Bible said he made great works. He built great houses. He built the grandest edifice, the greatest church of his day. He was known and admired around the earth. Success. Everything he put his hands to was successful. The Queen of Sheba, remember, comes to him and is breathless at his devotion to the house of God and the happiness of all the people around him, because it seemed like heaven on earth to her. Everything seemed like paradise. What a wonderful man of God. Known and respected people coming from the uttermost parts of the earth to see and hear his wisdom and his house and all the happy people around him. Here's a man who builds the biggest church building in the world, the biggest budget, the biggest bank account, the biggest congregation, the biggest choir and orchestra, the greatest songs ever penned on earth. And he ends up saying, it's all vanity. It is futile. All my works and all I've done have no meaning. A man is no better than a beast. He dies like a dog dies. And he goes to the earth just like an animal goes. He's no better than a beast. Then I looked on all the works that my hand had done and all the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. This has all been in vain. Now, folks, 
if, if there is a Bible scholar here, I want you to know I understand the argument that is made by modern scholars that, that Solomon is not the author of Ecclesiastes. In fact, they, they say a rich man, modern scholars, that a rich man penned these words and borrowed Sam, uh, Solomon's name to uh, validate his message. In fact, other so-called experts say there were two writers. One took the negative side and one took the positive side. Well, folks, I'm just going to take what the Scripture says. It says, the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. That's Solomon. Uh, no clapping, please. But there is a debate about that. But, folks, it's, whoever wrote this, and I believe it was Solomon, talked about the vanity of, of life, absolute vanity after having all the wisdom and all the knowledge and coming to this point of despair. Scripture says, He loved the Lord and walked in His statues. You see, this man had cast out the Abiathar ministry that was unfaithful and evil, and he brings in the Zadok holy priesthood to the house of God. And he loved the Lord and walked in his statues, and he prays humbly, I'm but a child. And he builds the house of the Lord, and he calls it a house of prayer and repentance and forgiveness. So what happened? Folks, there's no question this man had a crisis of faith came to pass when Solomon was old. His wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. Solomon did evil in the sight of God and went not fully after the Lord, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was not turned, because his heart was turned away from the Lord. And let me show you his crisis of faith. In the 11th chapter, verse 2, You shall not marry strange, meaning heathen wives, for surely they will turn your heart after their gods. Now, folks, this is a direct command given to him directly. I don't know if it it came through the prophet Nathan. I don't know if Zadok brought it to him. I don't know if it came to him in a dream. But the word of God came to him clearly. And said, you shall not, Solomon, you shall not marry strange wives. They'll turn your heart away from me after their gods. Solomon turns around. That is his crisis because this man had a lust problem. But more than that, his crisis is, do I obey God's word? Do I have the fear of God in my heart? You see, faith is not just focused on the great miracles that God can do, how He supplies need. Uh, What a wonderful... I've heard people say, He's a great man of faith because He has believed God for such great things. Well, no one is a man or woman of faith that they don't also believe that God keeps His Word and He judges sin. He judges iniquity. He judges disobedience. That is the other side of faith. I have to believe His Word. Not just that which blesses me, but I have to understand His warnings and take it to heart. My faith says, yes, I believe that if I willfully sin against God, and if I don't go to the Holy Spirit and seek deliverance, I'm going to pay the consequences for my sin. There are consequences to disobedience. We're talking about a crisis of faith. And this man is faced now with the word of God, thou shalt not. Don't marry these women. And this came after he'd already brought uh, the daughter of Pharaoh. That in itself should have been a warning. And, And God spoke clearly to this man. Don't do it. That's it. And suddenly we find Solomon says, married 700 heathen wives and had a harem of additional 300 concubines which means legitimized harlots. How many times did the Holy Spirit come to Solomon and said, I have warned you. It's enough. Break away. How many times has the Holy Spirit warned you, warned me, because a loving Savior 
so patient, so full of kindness and long-suffering. He says, you know that I have warned you. You know that this is contrary to my word. Stop it. You've been given all the promises of power, enabling that you need. Now stop. God commanded him, listen to this. Here's the reason I know that this was his crisis of faith, because of Scripture. In verse 10, God had commanded him concerning this thing, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. He's, God, the writer pinpoints it. This thing, this this giving oneself over to sensuality, giving yourself over to lust, giving yourself over to this. Because, you see, he didn't believe there were any consequences. He was going to be able to do this and get by with it and continue giving out his words of wisdom and continue. He had all the gold and silver he needed. He's not dependent on God. Why, why does he have to trust God? He's got everything a man could want. It's a dangerous place to be in a place where you have no more needs. I want God to keep me in need so that I can say every hour, Lord, I'm driven to you by my need. I'm driven to you by the forces that come against me. These things should drive us to our knees and seek the face of God. And out of that comes our trust and confidence in Him that He will be the victor. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as you did this, you have not kept my covenant, my word. I will surely rend the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. You see, this man didn't practice what he preached. He had been. He, this is what he said at the dedication of the temple. When a man shall know the plague of his own heart and spread his hands toward this house, hear from heaven and forgive, for you alone know the hearts of all men. Now, this is his message. This is what he's preaching to the to to this. To his people, he said, when the Spirit of God shows you the plague of your heart, run to the house of God. Run to him who can forgive you and cleanse you. Run to him because God knows what's in your heart. You see, when a man loses his faith, he loses his discernment. And he loses the fear of God. And folks, all over the world, that's what's happening now. This, this is why so many Christians, I, I told you this and this, and I'm saying it in closing, all over the world I see pastors and, and Christians and congregations everywhere saying, it's never been like this before. Folks, have you ever, we have never lived in a time like this before, where everything seems to be spinning out of control. The news is so frightening, so horrifying, that I don't like to listen to it anymore. What a shame that they're showing in schools now the Al-Qaeda cutting off the head of a Jew. And things like this that we could not comprehend. If we had said 20 years ago these things had happened, nobody would have believed us. And the trials and tests of God's people. But you see, God's looking for something. In this last day, when all hell breaks loose, He's got to have men and women of God of faith. Tested, tried faith that will hold on, that will be a testimony. Because there are going to be young people saying, what do we do? Where do we go? And they're going to go to those who've been through it and those who have that steady, quiet faith. I've been through the wars. I've been tested and I've been tried and I've proven God faithful. I've proven that I can run to Him and find consolation. I know the voice of the Lord. I know Him. I know Him. God has to have that. And that's why you're being tested. That's why you're going through what you're going through. And you're going to have to make a conscious decision. You're going, to, you're going to need His grace. You have His love and you have the promise of His grace. But now by faith, lay hold of it. By faith saying, God, you will not let me go. Because you have everything under control. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me, please.
Lord, I'm not going to preach my sermon again. I just want you to speak. If that was, if I preached your word and Holy Spirit, you were upon me, then you've promised to convict and convince and heal. And I ask you, Lord, to touch the lives of all who've heard this word. In the annex, the overflow, and here in the main auditorium, we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you finish the work that you have started. Complete it now. Lord, only you can reach the heart. Only you know the heart. I can't do it. Lord, I know that there are people hearing me now that are really at this critical point that we're talking about. This crisis. I don't know what the crisis is. But there's so many crises here. And Lord, it's it's not just some simple little thing. It, it's, it's a very deep, deep thing. My God, bring faith. Let faith arise. Hallelujah. God, you will not fail your people. You will not fail a single child of yours who will simply trust. God, hold me. God, keep me. I will believe you. I will trust you. No matter what comes. Thank you, Jesus. If you're going through a deep crisis this morning, I know the Lord put this in my heart. And you say, Brother Dave, my faith is wavering. You haven't lost your faith. You don't want to lose your faith, but you're wavering. And yet the scripture says, even of that, let he that wavers. Let him not think you receive anything from the Lord. He said, if you waver, you can't, I can't work. You tie my hands. If you are in that crisis, I want you to come and stand here. We'll pray for you, and, and let's believe the Lord now that there will be fresh faith. Fresh faith from the Holy Spirit. God bring you through. And the balcony, go to the stairs on the other side. And in the annex, you can go to the lobby, and the ushers will show you how to get into this building, come down this aisle, these aisles and come and meet me here. <clears throat> we'll wait for you, but move as quickly as you can. If you want prayer, if you say, Pastor Dave, this message was for me. And I really, now if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus, if you're backslidden, why don't you come with these? No one knows why you're coming. You come, that's between you and the Lord. Where have you, your life can be changed today. You can be set free. Some of you have backslidden. You've turned your back on what you know to be right. And the Holy Spirit's here to say today, I, I want you to get things right with the Lord. Get right with God today. Get back to your first love and the first call of God on your heart. Come as they sing. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no Come while I'm talking. Let's sing it one more time. I need. 
Testament, Paul speaking. Here's the crisis of faith for Paul, troubled on every side, perplexed, cast down. And this is what he said troubled on every side, yet not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, cast down, but not destroyed. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, for it has great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence in your hard time. You that are here now, will you look up to the Lord with me while I pray for you? Why don't you just look up? Not that uh, he's in the ceiling. But, you know, just away from yourself and others and just shut yourself in with the Lord now. Father, I pray for these that have come forward. We would be overwhelmed if we were able, if their eyes were projectors and they could project on the screen the crisis they're going through. Oh, how it would break our hearts and how, how overwhelming it would be to our senses. But, oh, God, you're a mighty God and nothing is too hard for you. You see and you know and you understand. But, oh, Lord, you will not... You will not stand for unbelief. No matter what the crisis. Lord Jesus, you wept at Lazarus' grave. Not over Lazarus, but you wept at that unbelief of your best friends. You wept because you said those who should have known better have not trusted me. They failed. Oh God, let us not fail in our trial now. For everyone that's come forward and all those within the sound of my voice, come, Holy Spirit, rise up with faith. Oh, let faith arise. Forgive our unbelief, Lord Jesus. Let us understand. Let us understand that it's not going to destroy us. Cast down, but not destroyed. Trouble on every side, but not distressed. Because God is on the throne. God is on the scene. Christ is with us, our living Savior. Now pray this prayer with me, please. Lord Jesus, you're king of the flood. You allow nothing in my life to destroy me. Not my salvation and not my faith. Oh God, touch me. Renew my faith. Renew my confidence in you. And I say now, with the power of the Holy Spirit, I trust God. I will trust God in my crisis, in my temptation and trial. Raise your hands in love on Jesus right now. Just say, I love you, Jesus. I worship you. Give me faith. Give me confidence. Lord, let me know and understand that this is what you desire from me more than anything else. More than a sacrifice of praise is this offering of faith and confidence in the Lord. Never leave you, never forsake you. I'll go with you to the very end. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. God, make Times Square Church a believing, trusting church so that people that come in here are not seeing a cast down people who are dragging into this church, burdened down as if there were no God. Oh, Lord, we have been given so much truth. We have been prompted over and over again to trust you. Lord, evidently, there's going to be a a great test coming to this nation again. God, in Times Square Church, in this house, among the ministers, 
and all the workers, and the choir, and the orchestra, everyone, Lord, that calls this church home. May this be a lampstand church to the city, to the nation, and to the world. That people can call here from anywhere in the world and find hope, encouragement. When everyone else is discouraged, let there be encouragement in this house. Let the glory of Jesus and his faithfulness shine forth. Oh, God, strip us of our unbelief. Pluck it out of our hearts that we can say truly, God is good. God is faithful. Lord, you can take us right to the gates of death. But all more than that, you can take us right through those gates into your holy presence. And we will not be afraid. We will not be those who, who through their whole life had the fear of dying, the fear of death. Take even the fear of death away from us, O oh God, so that we can rest in you. So that we can show the world, not just in our talk, but in the way we live in our manner and our countenance, that we are faith people. We are believing, trusting people. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the conclusion of the message.